Hello and welcome to a podcast about AP Molomer's heritage and more specifically on the topic about the container revolution. My name is Charlotte Andersen and I'm a historian here at Maersk and I am joined today by my colleague Henning Mohn. Hi, this is Henning and uh, we're really looking forward to talking about our role, the mask role in containerization. Yeah, so to start it all off, uh, there's been significant revolutions within shipping and the transportation of goods, like the introduction of steamships, for example. Steamships did not replace sailing ships immediately, but it was nonetheless a revolution in the sense that with the introduction of steamships, you were no longer dependent on wind to propel a vessel. A little later, the diesel engine made a significant impact uh, when they started being introduced into commercial vessels in the early 1900s. Uh, looking at today's landscape, we see new developments within propulsion technology, such as electric vessels and uh, now, of course, the transition into green fuels. Uh, the continued implementation of automation, uh, robots or equipment, automation in ports, and all revolutionary developments in their own rights. But none of these examples are perhaps as revolutionary as the introduction of the container or has made such a huge impact on global trade. So that's what we're talking about today. And uh, Henning, if you could put a few words to the significance of the container today, what would that be? I think the the fact that uh, we in many countries can buy bananas every day, every day of the year, uh, that bananas are supplied into our supermarkets so that we at a reasonable price can buy a banana. That is really unknown to most people that um, this is only because we have the refrigerated container uh, at our dis disposal, that the uh, refrigerated, refrigerated container has been developed um, with the te technology that is available today. Um, and that is just one sign of how containerization really impacts uh, the lives of, uh, of all of us on an everyday basis. So, but that's more or less how it looks today, right? So if we are to talk more about how it uh, developed and how it started here uh, in our company, where should we begin? Uh, the formal starting date for containerization in, in mask line, as it was called at the time, is um, the 5th of sept September, 1975. But even at that time, the, the container as a concept was uh, more than 20 years old. Uh, so that's also to say that mass line in the beginning was never a first mover in containerization. But 1975 is the date where we started containerizing our root network. Mm. And and sort of le leaning or leading up to that, uh, also we could take go back even further to like after the Second World War and that economic boom that happened afterwards, uh, which of course also influenced that global trade grew rapidly. But the technology in ports more or less stayed the same. So conventional cargo trading, it, you, it still meant that you would have to uh, manually load and offload vessels at the ports, right? If we see, uh, if we take a look at, uh, at the international economy developments uh, after 1945, uh, we see a growth in, in, in the western part of the world. Um, and I'm saying western part because at that time uh, the Cold War meant that we had one block of countries, which we call the western part of countries, and we had another block of countries called the eastern part. But in the western part of the, the, the economy, world economy, uh, growth was uh, at the core. And uh, basically, the, um, uh, the people, the average people, got more money. Uh, they uh, procured more things. They, they bought bigger houses. They uh, bought kitchens. They, they, you know, the, the whole uh, consumer um, behavior as we actually know it today mm. uh, also came into play. So therefore, yeah, more goods had to be moved around the world. Which meant, of course, you had to have bigger vessels and uh, you also had to gain more efficiency at the port, right? Because at that time, uh, it is said also that uh, the vessels would stay in port more time than they would be at sea. And of course, it's at sea that they are actually making money. Absolutely. As a ship owner, that's your view. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, um, so what did we do in Maersk sort of to compensate for for that large economic boom and more trades uh, or goods? Uh, if we look at the AP Moller Group, 
uh, at the time in the 1950s, 1960s, our main business at that time was really uh, the transport of oil. Crude oil uh, was uh, a factor in the growth of um, the world economy. And uh, AP Moller really became a factor in the in the movement of uh, crude oil out of the Middle East to the main markets in North Europe, uh, North America, and eventually also Japan and other uh, uh, Asian countries. Uh, however, at the same time, Maskline uh, did uh, expand. Um, the trade patterns in the world at that time, in the 1950s, 1960s, was very much uh, governed by the fact that we still had the old colony powers of the world. So um, naturally, the, um, the British shipping companies would um, protect, defend their markets in the British colonies. The Dutch uh, shipping companies would do the same in their colonies and the French in the French and so on. And it was uh, virtually impossible for a, a small outsider uh, and a relatively small shipping company from far away Denmark uh, to get into those markets. So we had to expand in niche markets. And we did so in, in Southeast Asia, in the Middle East, in West Africa, um, uh, adding to the original service in mass line uh, from the US to Asia. So we were a relatively small player uh, during that time. Mm. So we started to containerize in 1975, but when did containerization actually begin? Well, there is a date. Uh, the 26th of April 1956 is the date where the first container was lifted on board a vessel uh, that happened in Newark in, on the east coast of the US. And the invention of the container, um, is that credit is given to a gentleman called Malcolm McLean, uh, who would later start a company called Sealand. Um, he was, uh, Mr. McLean was originally a trucker. And the story is that one day he got the idea that why not lift the box behind him on board a vessel rather than taking out all the goods uh, of the box and then put them onto the vessel and having to put them back into a box at the other end of a voyage. So uh, he developed the technology. Uh, it's easier said than done. Uh, and uh, they introduced containerization as, uh, as a solution to that lack of efficiency that we saw in ports uh, in the 1950s uh, and also later, of course, in the 1960s. Um, so for the first 10 years from 1956, containerization was very much an American thing. Um, I think actually they, they made a small mistake uh, in the beginning because the companies that went into containers started competing on size. So one company had one size of containers, uh, others had, had other sizes. And that does not enhance modal intermodalism, that you can move a container from one means of transport to another, from a ship to a truck to a, a train car, uh, on the opposite. But again, back to politics, uh, the global situation in the 1950s uh, created the demand for uh, a lot of bases uh, around the world for the American government. And they needed to move a lot of material to those bases. And they simply requested a, a uniform way of, of moving that good, good, those goods, and um, that led to the uh, development of the standard container as we know it today. Uh, it was an international corporation which uh, was adapted uh, internationally in, uh, in the mid-1960s, uh, and the fact that we got a standard container uh, with the measurements 8 by 8 feet times length, 10 foot, 20 foot, 30 foot, 40 foot, um, that meant that the ship owners could start designing vessels specifically for the transport of containers. And the first vessels came out in 1965-1966. Um, when we wrote a book uh, about mass line and containerization, uh, a little bit by chance we found a report from McKinsey uh, given to the or issued to the um, the, the British Ducks Board, uh, which was the administration of the of the United Kingdom uh, ports, and that report from 1966, uh, it was basically a recommendation that the port started changing into being able to handle container vessels. And you can just imagine this. Uh, let's say the the managing director of the the port of Liverpool. Uh, sitting at his desk reading this uh, report in 1966 and then looking out the window, he didn't see any container vessels. 
he probably did not see any containers at all. And then he had to make a business decision that said, you need to invest in some container cranes. He did not, uh, obviously. And um, and that basically led to the British ports coming, you know, falling behind uh, within 10 years. Um, but that was how containers started. Um, and, and containerization, in my book, really started in 1966 when we saw the first real container ships coming into the market. At the same time where the standard container was being introduced into the market, uh, we were in, in niche markets in Southeast Asia, in the Middle East and West Africa, where the container did not arrive early. But that doesn't mean we didn't improve our uh, cargo handling efficiency, because in the mid-1960s we introduced these seven new highly innovative vessels called the sea ships. They had the side port openings, um, which meant that we could move pallets uh, directly into the hull of the vessels from the side. The seven sea vessels that you were mentioning are called sea vessels because their first name started with a C. Cecilia Mask, Clara Mask, even Charlotte Mask. Yeah. And the real hero in the operations of those vessels is, of course, the captain and his crew. But when they were in port, the pallet truck was the hero because the pallet truck was operating not only on the key, uh, key uh, putting in the pallets into the side ports of the vessel, but also inside the vessels you had a pallet truck. So the efficiency gain by mechanizing the, the cargo handling uh, with the pallet and the pallet truck uh, was a, a real gain for us uh, and our customers, of course, uh, and um, really improved turnaround time in, in, in ports. Uh, so the, the story that you started out by telling that that in the beginning, before the um, the container, ships would actually stay in port longer than they were at sea. That changed uh, in the 1960s, even before the container, but with pallets, which again was just a middle thing between the um, the old conventional handling of cargo and the container. Because there was still more efficiency gains to come with the container, right? Absolutely. So it was the shipping companies that actually had to push that development, more or less? In the, in the beginning, it was the shipping companies who led that development and, and uh, I, I guess, positioned the container uh, to their customers as a new uh, available uh, option for, for transporting goods. And it was a slow revolution uh, starting in 1956, and we can see in some markets that revolution is actually still happening now. Yeah, because it took a little while before, as you mentioned, uh, uh, we started containerizing in 1975. So there's still a quite a, a big gap right before we really went into it. We we established a number of crash committees over the years, and they looked into uh, the business opportunity. And uh, to put it simply, not enough customers requested the containers, uh, not enough customers requested the services around the container. But eventually, the market. Uh, changed and um, when we made the decision to go into containers which formally happened in in uh, February 1973 um, one of the participants once uh, expressed that uh, we did not make the decision to go into containers the market made the decision for us so it was actually a question of either we were to be uh, competed out of liner shipping or change into containers and stay in liner shipping so we made the decision, ordered the first ships, and it took two years for those ships to be built, and they came into the market from uh, from September 1975. And going from there, so when we actually took the decision, the containerization of our entire network, that happened actually fairly quickly compared, because you, of course you had to not only build all these vessels, you also had to ensure that they could... Um, call ports, uh, and that the ports that we call could handle this new type of um, uh, cargo transportation? Um, we containerized the first route in September 1975, and that was all our original service from the US to, uh, to Asia. Uh, and uh, at that time, uh, the, the vessels could call, call only at the major ports, which uh, had uh, built container cranes. Uh, for example, when the first service started in in, um, 
in New York in, in September 1975, the container crane at Pier 51, which was our uh, pier in New York, that container crane was not finished yet. And the same was uh, the case in, in Oakland, that they had only one container crane uh, op in operation. So it was still a, a developing market in the major ports. Um, it took us five years before we containerized our ne next route or service. That was in 1980, uh, the Europe Asia service. Uh, but already by 1986, <coughs> we had basically containerized all our liner services, right? Yes, uh, and they were, of course, not as many as today very much east-west around the globe. Uh, but there were new markets developing, for example, the Middle East, and uh, a lot of um, equipment for, for oil exploration, oil production going into the Middle East, a lot of uh, um, construction materials going in, and, and uh, that was really one of our big markets. But again, the terminal in Dubai, for example, was hardly ready for us, so we actually deployed vessels, container vessels, with their own cranes on board, because the port were, uh, was not ready yet. So by 1986, we have more or less completed the containerization of our uh, whole network. Um, just to round it off, like in 1973, when the decision to containerize was made, we had offices in five countries, only five. Some 30 years later, in 1990, we had offices in 40 countries. And although this is an impressive sign of our growth, then nothing compares really to the next decade. By the year 2000, Maersk was in more than 100 countries. And had become glo global by that time. And that is really a story about the next couple of decades from 1986 onwards. And we're looking forward to talking about that in our next podcast. Thank you very much, Charlotte. Thank you.